All right. God bless you, man. And it's an honor to be here again, uh, you know, out in California is what I mean, uh, coming after and speaking after my pastor, uh, Pastor Brian, and the great message that he started us off with. And no doubt we're going to have a tremendous time in the Lord. I want to give a shout out to my boys in Virginia who are simulcasting this at our church. And... Amen. All right, and so we're just thankful, thankful to be here. Now, here's the thing about what happened with me. 25 years ago, I was trained by the finest fighting force the world has ever seen, the United States Marine Corps. And, and one of the things that they taught me how to do is to recognize the enemy and his schemes and his devices and his tricks and the things that he has up his sleeve. And so because I know that and because I've been trained like that, spiritually it's the same way. In order for us to know how to defeat our enemy, we must know a little bit about him. We must have some kind of knowledge on him or the Bible says, lest Satan should take advantage of us for we're not ignorant of his devices. So that means if we're ignorant of his devices, he can take advantage of us. So that means that we must go back to Genesis, back to the beginning, to see how Satan slithered his way on the scene to deceive our first parents. And so turn with me in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 3. Uh-oh, they can't light, they can't see. Y'all should know, you should know what Genesis chapter 3 is in the beginning, isn't it? Go to the table of contents and make a right. <laughs> You'll get there. <laughs> so, so it's all right. It's all right. Genesis chapter 3. Now, one of the things it says there in verse 1, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said... You shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Now, we see this serpent it is a, it was an instrument Satan used to talk to Eve. You know, I, I, I just assume, I don't know about you, but I just assume that it was a normal thing for Adam and Eve to talk to the animals. Because if it wasn't, as soon as this serpent came up and started talking... I don't know about you, but if I was Eve, I would have been like, now, before I even decide to answer you, what in the world are you doing talking? So it's obvious it must have been something by which it was a normal thing for them to converse with these animals. Three things I see in this verse. Number one, Eve talking with this serpent, and we will see how this will get her and her husband in a lot of trouble. The second thing I see is Satan questioning Eve and not Adam. It's always been said, where was Adam? We, we have no clue. Was he playing with some of the animals? Or at this time? I don't know what he was doing. We just know he wasn't here. Now, why didn't Satan go to Adam to talk? Because I suggest to you, if you want to get to a man, you go through his wife. Men, we, it, it, keep, be mindful of that. The Bible in 1 uh, Peter 3, 7 calls her the weaker vessel. Now, it, it, it's a term of endearment. It's not a term of inferiority. It, it, it talks about how the woman is a, a, like a wine glass. It means something that is very delicate, like a wine glass. Men, we're like a frosty mug, root beer mug. We're rough and tough and that sort of thing. You know, and, and our wives are sensitive. They, they are loving. And that's why when our children fall down and skin their knee, they don't come to us father's frosty mug. Because all I'm going to do is say, boy, get on up and get back out there and play. But, but the mother would say, oh, come here, baby. You just come here, honey, baby. All right, let me just think. You need to go to the emergency room. That's just. It's just how God wired us up. The third thing I see in this particular verse, we see Satan questioning God's word. He said, has God indeed said? 
And this is one of the tricks and schemes of the devil is to get us to question God's word. Now, there's nothing wrong with having a question about the word of God. It's something you don't understand. But it's another thing. It's another thing to question God's word because you doubt that it is true. And this is what Satan was trying to do to Eve. In other words, Satan was saying God is keeping something from you that is good. And he tells the same thing to our children. That God is trying to keep you from having fun. And he tries to whisper these things in our hearts and our minds. And that's why Satan is called cunning or deceptive in this particular verse. Now, look what it says in verses 2 through 5. It says, And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said you should not eat of it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now here is Satan taken away from God's word and Eve adding to God's word. God didn't say you couldn't touch it. He didn't say that. See, this is what happens to us when we, like Eve, add to God's word. It leads to legalism, which is adding rules and regulations to keep us from the forbidden fruit. And this is what the religious leaders did in Jesus' day. They added over 600 or so. 600 or so rules and regulations keeping them from breaking the original Ten Commandments. And we do this in our lives, and we do this even in our children's lives, men, adding harsh and unnecessary rules and regulations to try to put up barriers to keep us and our children from the forbidden fruit. Burdens too hard to bear. Unnecessary harshness that we bring into our homes. And what happened is we, we raise our children with a, with a, with a mindset that they, they all of a sudden start re, resenting Christianity. They grow up resenting Christianity. You know why? Because we taught them how to have a legal relationship with God instead of a loving one. And there are too many things, too many restrictions and harsh things that we place in their lives. No different than what Eve did by adding to the word of God. Look what it says in verses 6 and 7. It says, so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took of the fruit and ate, and she also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed thick leaves together and made themselves covering. Now in these verses, Eve took the bait, because she fell into the trap that all temptation fall into one of three categories. Pastor Brian mentioned it, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. Verse 6 says that the tree was good for food. That is, no doubt, the lust of the flesh. It was pleasant to the eyes. That is, the lust of the eyes. And the desirable to make one wise. That is, the pride of life. Satan brought these things to Eve, and he brought them to Jesus in Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. It says, won't you turn these stones into bread? Use your divine power to, to satisfy your own needs, is what he was telling them, fulfilling the lust of the flesh. Cast yourself down, because you know God is going to send some angels to take care of you. Well, just cast yourself down. No doubt we know the pride of life. And he showed them all the kingdoms and their glory showed them the lust of the eyes. And no doubt, Satan's schemes is that he did it to Eve, he did it to Jesus, and he would do it to us too. First John 2, verses 15 through 17 says, Love not this world, neither the things that are in this world. If any man loves this world, the love of the Father is not in him. All that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but of this world. And the world passes away, and the lust thereof, but he who does the will of God abides forever. He comes to us with the same thing, the same mess that he took to Eve, he took to Jesus, and he's bringing to us the same type of stuff. And men, we need to be careful. Lust of the flesh, having sex with someone you're not married to, the lust of the eyes, magazines, internet, all this sort of stuff. Men, 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 listen up, men, 
Listen up. We got to do something about this pornography stuff. We have to do something about it. Men, it's, it's killing us. It's killing us. It's killing us spiritually. It's, it's killing our marriages. It's killing our walks with the Lord. It's killing, it, you know what? The pornography is killing us as men to the point where we can't even look at a, a Christian sister with purity of eyes because the, the pornography has, has caused us to look with, at them in a way that is not pure. Man, we have to do something. It's killing us. But I'm so thankful that with Jesus Christ, there is hope. Because Jesus said, I am the resurrection. Meaning that Jesus said, I can resurrect whatever it is that has died in your life. I can resurrect your marriage. I can resurrect your joy. I can resurrect your walk spiritually. Whatever it is that has died, Jesus said, I can resurrect it. And he wants to do that in your life today. Because this pornography thing is killing us. It's killing us to the point where we can't even look at the advertisement that come in the Sunday paper without some sort of lust stirring up in our hearts. Man, we have to do something about it. And so here it is, the same type of stuff that, that happened with Eve, happened with Jesus, is happening to us. And so Eve brought this fruit to Adam and he ate it. You know what I see in that? She brought the fruit to Adam and he ate it, but here's the thing about that. I found this to be true. We always bring other people into our sin. We see it with Achan in the Old Testament. We see it with the guys who were jealous of Daniel in the book of Daniel. We always bring other people into our sin. We think that we're doing something and it's just us. It's just, it's just us and our little world. But we always bring other people into our sin. Let me ask you this, man. Who else are you bringing into your sin? You bringing your children? You bringing your family, your wife? We always bring other people into our sin. And, you know, here's, here's the thing I want you to, to see is that, you know, when we look at Adam and Eve in this whole story, he knew what he was doing. He, he partook of the fruit, and he knew what he was doing. This is why the, the Bible calls him, Adam, a type of Christ. And, and, and Romans 5.14 calls him a type or symbol of Jesus Christ. And in what way is he a type or symbol of Jesus Christ? This means that he willingly, Adam did, willingly gave his life for his bride, Eve, as Christ gave his life on the cross for his bride, the church. But here's the difference. Adam willingly gave over to sin something Jesus never did do to please his bride, Eve. And people are doing this today. Men, you're doing it now. Many of you are willingly disobeying God for the sake of your wife. Something God clearly has spoken to your heart about, but you, 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 you're disobeying just to please your wife. And there's things that's going on, things that we do because we love our wife. Some of us, we're willing to disobey God in order to please them, and something God never called us to do. Yes, God called us to love them but never to love them to the point where we're going to disobey him in order to please them. Oh, God is speaking to somebody today. He's speaking to you about something that you're doing to please your wife, but it's also causing you to disobey God. Look what it says there in, um, in verses 8 through 11. It says, And they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? Now, in these verses, Adam and Eve heard God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. For many years, I just thought that that was in the cool of the day. That's either early in the morning or maybe late at night. I, I, for the longest, I, I, I thought of that. But then when I began to look a little bit closer, the word, the word cool in the Hebrew is ruach. And, 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 and we know that that word can be translated spirit or wind and that sort of thing. And the day that it's talking about here is the day of judgment. 
So it could be they heard God coming in the spirit of the day of judgment, and they hid themselves. And I would have too. But this is what sin does. It causes us to hide from God. When we hide from God, we start coming to church, we start reading our Bibles and praying. Let me ask you this, man. Are you hiding from God today? You, have all, you can always come back to him. He, he's always there. Whenever I think of coming back to God, I think of the father in the, the parable of the prodigal son. And how that, son, how that father went every day trying to see if that son is coming back, because the Bible says when, when he saw him afar off, he ran toward him. That means that he was looking for him. And so too God is looking for you. And even he sees you from afar off, even when you begin to make baby steps toward him, he's going to run toward, him, toward you. This is the only time in the Bible it depicts God as being in a hurry. He is always in a hurry to forgive you, to restore you, to bring you back into a right relationship with him. As, as our ultimate pastor, Pastor Chuck has always taught us, what do you hear when you hear that, where are you? Do you hear the voice of an arresting officer? Maybe you hear the voice of your father, how your father dealt with you. Where are you, boy? Get on, boy, get on over here. But that is not the voice here. We always read into, we've been taught, read into the Bible tones that are not there. And this is God being no doubt heartbroken. Asking Adam, where are you? Now, God, it wasn't that God didn't know where he was. You know, you, you understand that, don't you? But he wanted Adam to admit where he was. So my question for you today is, where are you today? Where are you spiritually? Where are you in your walk with the Lord? Do you see yourself growing? Have you stopped growing? Has something come into your life that's hindered that? And the Lord is asking you, where are you today? And, and we need to understand that the Lord is not trying to, you know, get, you know, God was not after information but confession. He wanted Adam to confess where he was, and so too is here today. That's why there's a prayer room that, that is available, because God wants you to acknowledge right now, where are you? Where are you today? in your walk with the Lord. We can easily fool ourselves. You know, no doubt I lived out here for almost 10 years in California. You're out here in the midst of some of the greatest Bible teachers the world has ever seen. And you can go from Bible study to Bible study and all this stuff. And many of you, you treat Bible study like, like wine tasters. You just want to, and you know, sample you some wine. And you go from this Bible study to this Bible study to this Bible, sampling, just sampling. And you think you got it on the ball spiritually because you are a Bible study sampler. But my question is, where are you really with the Lord? Are you just taking in information? If we just take in food and don't let it out, we have become bloated, lethargic, and many of you spiritually are like that, and you don't even realize it. That's why to today, the Lord is pointing it out right now and just saying, you know what, you're bloated. You're lethargic. You're just, just full of just Bible studies. Where are you serving? What church are you serving? Because you're a wine taster here, you're a Bible study taster there, and over here, where are you serving? Like I tell people back in Virginia, you need to get your little hiney somewhere and sit down in that church and serve and, get, and stop bouncing around from all over the place. Get somewhere, sit down, take in the word, and serve right there. Oh, see, some of y'all, that's a little too hard. That's Virginia harsh there. That's, that's okay. Y'all, Southern California can't handle it. <laughs> I soften it up for you surfers. You know, and you, I soften it up a little bit. You forgot I'm a former Marine, so you know that stuff doesn't mean anything. 
But the question is, where are you in your walk with the Lord? Notice how Adam said that I heard your voice and I was afraid. That, that blows me away. No doubt the, the Bible said they used, to, they used to walk together in the cool of the day. And now that which he used to look forward to, that which he used, used to bring joy to his life, now he's afraid of. The voice that he looked to guide his life and to receive instruction, that voice that guided his life on a daily basis now is bringing him fear. And that blows me away because I'm wondering, is that you today? Are you afraid of the voice of the Lord? Is that why you stopped reading? Is that why you stopped coming to church? Because that which you used to look forward to, now you're afraid of. That just blows me away when I, when I read that. Now in verses 12 through 15, and I can see my time, I only got five minutes. It says, then the man said, the, um, said, the woman whom you gave me, <laughs> I, I'm going to come back. <laughs> the woman who you gave, gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I ate. And the Lord said to the woman, why is it that you, what is this you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. And then the Lord said to the serpent, because you have done this and you are cursed more than uh, all cattle and more than any beast of the field, on your belly you shall go and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. Wow. Here what we have, one of the tricks of the enemy is to get us, especially as men, to participate in what is called the blame game. There are many contestants to the blame game, and here we see Adam, Eve, and the serpent. Adam has been called down to contestant role and called on the carpet, and what did he do? It was the woman you gave me. Oh, man, how many of you are blaming your wives for where you are right now? Blaming your wife. Blaming your wife. And then, then you go as far as blaming God. It was the woman you gave me. God, had you not given me this woman, I wouldn't be in a mess I'm in now. So, we not only blame our wives, but uh, this one blows me away by blaming our wives. The Bible says if a man finds a wife, he finds a good thing, I obtain favor from the Lord. Notice, if a man finds, you found her. <laughs> so you're going to blame her, you found her. Look in the mirror and blame yourself, you the one found her. Don't blame God. See, so often we want to blame everybody for stuff we do. We're going to blame our wives, we're going to blame God, we're going to blame everybody for stuff that we do. Hey, let me tell you something. It's not your parents' fault. It's not your grandparents' fault. It's not the job's fault. It's not your wife's, your children. You've got to take responsibility for your own actions. And this is something we must do. So Eve was called down to contestant role. Eve, what is it you have done? Well, yeah, it was the serpent. He tricked me. Serpent, what is that you have done? Oh, man, you can Satan. Devil made me do it. <laughs> and and we, we, we do this. Men, let me tell you something. Let's, stop, let's take responsibility for our own actions. Stop blaming everybody else for mess we do. And so we see these, these schemes, these devices, these... These, these strategies that Satan come up with, he gets us to play the blame game. And we can't play the blame game. We have to take responsibility for our own actions. And then the Lord, I'm going to have to summarize this part. Then the Lord said, because you heeded the voice of your wife, you know, he, he calls him on the carpet for that. Man, do you know when to heed and when not to heed the voice of your wife? The Lord called Adam on the carpet here and said, because you heeded the voice of your wife, this, that, and the other. Then later on, uh, uh, Abraham 
it, the Lord tells him, because you heeded the voice of your wife, then later tells him, hey, heed the voice of, uh, of your wife. Man, do you know when to heed and when not to heed? It's all wrapped up in whether what she's saying is lining up with the word of God. So that means you must be a man of the word. Because how would you know what she's saying is of the word if you're not a man of the word yourself? We must be men of the word. In order to know when to heed and when not to heed the voice of our wives. Man, my time has run out. God bless you.